We're going to try that again. Good morning, Cornerstone. How you guys doing this morning? <laughs> I want to say hello. If you guys are new, welcome to Cornerstone. It's so nice to have you guys here. Uh, make sure to reach out in front of you, grab that Connect card and fill it out. Take it to the front desk and there will be a special gift waiting for you. If you guys have any questions about the church or you have any prayer requests, make sure to fill that out on there as well so we can answer any questions you guys may have and join, um, come alongside you guys and join you in prayer as well. First and foremost, we have youth group and young adults tonight. We got some amazing leaders leading that, and youth group will be um, from 3.30 to 5 p.m., and young adults will be meeting from uh, 6.30 to 8 p.m. And so if you have any kids who are crazy and have a lot of energy, make sure you bring them. Uh, we'll have, they'll have a fun time, and they get to learn about Jesus. So it's a double whammy. And now for all the ladies out there, I know you guys have been waiting for this one. It's an exciting night for all the Pablo Picassos and the Bob Rosses. We'll have a fun paint night coming April 22nd. Yes, April 22nd. There'll be a paint night. April 29th, <laughs> 6.30 to 8 p.m. Uh, here at Cornerstone. It will be $20 a person, and this will cover the cost of the canvas, the paint, and the snacks. So if you're ready to have a fun time and show off your creative skills, make sure to show up and go to the Welcome Center uh, to sign up and then have a special night. Uh, lastly, we have our adult Bible study coming up May 4th. Oh, you can't read it. <laughs> May 4th. Uh, everything's to be determined, but except the date. But no, it'll be a fun time. We've had some amazing Bible studies so far. Um, and so if you guys are really looking forward to that, make sure to just be checking our Instagram, Facebook, and listen to announcements because we'll make sure to give you guys the name of the book and everything else. And lastly, for a special opportunity with Mantino Outreach, I'm going to have Rod come up and talk about the Pablo Picasso. Thanks, sir. We started out last uh, Saturday, yesterday, uh, did 700 uh, uh, houses in Mantino with Saturate Mantino uh, that before it started raining. But what a neat experience that is. The city of Mantino is laid out uh, with uh, the, each area uh, designated with a circle around it and how many houses are in that. There's 3,000 houses total. Great opportunity. I really have been touched by this. You got a car moving down the street with people on both sides. The car carries all these uh, little packages that goes on the uh, doorknobs. And uh, with the next two Saturdays, we hope to cover Mantino, all 3,000 homes. Uh, there's a sign up sheet out here. We could certainly use the help. Uh, if your address is Mantino, we certainly could use the help. But if it's not, uh, show up at the United Methodist Church in Mantino at 9 o'clock the next two Saturdays, and those are the two Saturdays leading up to Easter. And to think that people are putting their shoe leather and praying for every house in Mantino uh, and putting the information here with a tract in it, how to accept Christ, and seven churches, including ours, have their information there. So I think it's a great opportunity. I'm enjoying it a lot. We'd love to see more people there so we can get it done in the next, uh, in the next two Saturdays. Nine o'clock, United Methodist Church. God bless you. Well, can you stand and greet each other today?
Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior.
today at your salvation, God, and what it means for this Lent season, what it means for your death, for your resurrection. God, may you work in our hearts today, and may we bless the fabric of the pure gospel. And if we're thankful in nothing else, may we be thankful in just that alone. While we're still sinners, you died for us. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can take.
Good morning, all. Good to see you. Um, I know if you know my daughter, Kate. Kate uh, is seven and a half months pregnant, and she's at that stage now where uh, the baby is starting to jiggle around inside of her, keeping her awake at night. And I said, tell me when, you know, because I want to feel that baby moving. And I've watched four babies come into this world, and if you've ever witnessed that, it's got to be, you, know, you have to see it to believe it, that something like that can actually happen. And every time you see it, you believe it again. And the same thing is true about when people come to faith in Jesus Christ and receive him as their Savior and Lord, something happens to them that's described as being born again. And to see it is to believe it. And to see it again is to believe it again. So today we're going to talk about that experience. And we get to uh, kind of listen in on a conversation that Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. It's probably one of the most intimate conversations recorded in the Bible in the New Testament. It's one of my favorite passages to preach on too. It's kind of like we get to get in on a one-on-one on -on -one conversation that John records so we're going to look at that, and it's about being born again. John chapter 3, and, again, and it ends with John 3.16, actually it goes a little longer than that, but that, that famous John 3.16 is in the context of this story, of this conversation Jesus has with this man named Nicodemus. That's the context. So let's join in on this conversation. John 3, beginning at verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do not understand these things. So we're introduced. We'll stop there. We'll continue in a minute, but... We're introduced to this man named Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee. Now, that means he was from the conservative branch of first century Judaism, respected in the community for its discipline, good deeds, and commitment to orthodoxy. 
These are the conservative guys. Sometimes they were a little excessive in their rule keeping. On top of his religious affiliation, he was a member of the Jewish uh, Council of 71 called the Sanhedrin, who ruled the country under the Roman government. This means he belonged to both a specific religious party and to the political elite. So this guy is, is up, up at the top of the pile in terms of Jewish leadership in, in Israel at the time. Jesus even calls him Israel's teacher. Now that expression suggests that he is widely regarded and is a distinguished uh, professor of the scriptures, which would be the Old Testament. He's like a Jewish Mike Cordetti over there. Don't you love his teaching? Last week we have a great teaching team here. It says that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Some of you know about the show Nick at Night on Nickelodeon. That's where that show comes from. Not really. Why does, Jesus, does Nicodemus show up at night? Now, many believe it's because he would have been embarrassed to be seen with Jesus during the day. So he comes at night. And that would be a very easy explanation, except that Nicodemus shows up several times in the Gospel of John, and every time he does, he doesn't care what people think. So I don't think he comes at night because he's embarrassed about being seen with Jesus. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. This is what I think. If you read the Gospel of John, you note how John plays around with light and darkness. Later on, for example, when Jesus is betrayed, as, Jesus goes out of, as Judas goes out of the room, John makes this comment, and it was night. It's, just, it's, it's as if John is saying, here's a guy who is in the dark about Jesus. It was night. He's in the dark. He's what we sometimes call a lost soul. You know any lost souls? It's night. It's Nicodemus is a lost soul. Now here's a truth about being a lost soul. You could be smart. You can be connected socially, religiously, you can be wealthy, you can be friendly, you can be respected by everyone, you can go to church, you can be biblically knowledgeable and still be a lost soul. You can be brown or black, or white or pink, you can have lots of money or you can be broke. be a lot of different people and still be in the dark, a lost soul. We've had lots of lost souls circulate through a church like this one. If every lost soul who ever connected here became a Christian and stayed here, we'd be a church of 10,000 people. And here's the thing about lost souls. They come to connect with Jesus for all sorts of reasons. Because they're going through something difficult. Hoping God somehow can help them. Or they're searching for what is missing in their lives and Jesus is a, one among many possibilities. Or because they are looking for someone to date or to marry. And a lot of lost souls come through here for that reason. Or because they've gone elsewhere and they don't know where else to turn or because they're lonely looking for friends and so on and so on. But the one thing true of all of them is that they are in the dark about Jesus. They're lost that way. But they come to Jesus looking for answers. I love what God says about lost souls who come to connect with him. Recorded by Matthew in Chapter 7, verse 8, Jesus says, For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. I don't think I overstate it to say that 
the believer or the church that is not welcoming to lost souls are not the believers or the churches that Jesus recommends. If you're a lost soul and looking to connect with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, you're very welcome here. Nicodemus is a lost soul who comes to Jesus at night. Verse 2. Nicodemus says to Jesus, imagine the two of them now, wherever they are. At, I always see him in a cafe at night. Nicodemus says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. First of all, I appreciate that Nicodemus is very respectful towards Jesus. No matter where someone is coming from, it's always good to be respectful and civil when speaking to or about Jesus. Nicodemus starts with a statement to Jesus that mixes facts with a dose, a big dose of curiosity. Things about Jesus have become obvious to him that cause him to believe that Jesus is a teacher who's come from God. What things? The signs, he says. The things he does. He knows he's from, Jesus is from God because of the signs that accompany his teachings. He's talking about the miracles of healing people and deliverance and control over the elements of nature. Water is turned to wine, the blind see, the lame walk, the storm is stilled. You must be from God. The signs point to it, Nicodemus says. What do signs do? See any signs driving in this morning? They announce or they, they point to the reality that they represent. I came in this morning. Down 6,000 from Mantino, turned on 45, and there's a big sign. It's the sign that says Bourbon A, and the mayor, Shore, is written on it. The sign itself is not Bourbon A. But the sign points to the reality of Bourbonnet. So Nicodemus sees a lot of supernatural signs pointing to the reality of the supernatural Jesus. It's just a little thing, but I want to notice that Nicodemus comes alone, yet it says we, he says we, as he talks with Jesus. He says, we know that you are a teacher that has come from God. And now, who are the we? The we are the others who Nicodemus knows who are just like him. There are a lot of lost souls who see the supernatural signs of Jesus, but don't see him yet. They're blind to him. They see the signs, but they're blind to him. If they would just go a little further, they would see him. He's actually standing right next to them in many cases. And they see the signs, but they don't see him. Know anybody like that? Over the years here, we've had what I call the growing row syndrome. And that is someone will connect with Jesus here in some way that lights them up and causes them to bring others they know with them to church. And so they come with their friends and their relatives who've been inspired by what's going on in this person's life. And the row grows. First it's them, then somebody else, and somebody else, and then it's a whole row of people who want to find out, who are intrigued about this Jesus. So Nicodemus says, we, we see, not just me, these signs of the supernatural. He wants to find out more about him. It's more than just him. Jesus responds to Nicodemus' curiosity. Verse 3, 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. What a strange remark. Now, Jesus knows something about Nicodemus as a teacher of Israel. This teacher longs for the coming of God's kingdom. They all did. He sees the signs of it. He knows the Old Testament prophecies. He sees the signs of it in Jesus, the miracles, as evidence that this kingdom has come, something they're all anticipating. The Old Testament is full of promises about it. And they both know it would be the fulfillment of Daniel's fifth kingdom. And they're in the fourth right now. That's Rome. The next one is the eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God that would come. And here you have someone who has all the signs of it. This kingdom will be different than all the other kingdoms before it. It will be eternal and it will be built on the ruins of all the sinful empires of man, Daniel says, Daniel 2.44. It will be a kingdom of truth. Could we use a little truth? It will be a kingdom of peace. Anybody long for peace? It will be a kingdom of justice. How about some justice in this world? Jesus, in Jesus, Nicodemus sees it signs that this kingdom has come, something he's prayed for probably every day of his life since being a ruler of Israel. John later writes about this kingdom of God when he sees it in his revelation when it has fully come. The Lord, John writes, will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I long for that kingdom. I visited Jack Bright's sister Robin this past week. I asked Jack if I could tell you about it. She's in hospice care. She's been suffering from cancer and will die soon. She has moments of lucidity. Mostly she just stares off into the room. In one of those moments, as I was kneeling next to her, holding her hand, suddenly the stare broke into. I could tell she saw me. And she said, pray for me, I want to go to heaven. Pray for me, I want to go to heaven. In a world filled with trouble, more than anything in the world, Nicodemus wants to see the kingdom of God come. And he's so tired of the way life is in this world, longs for the day when things will be different. An eternity when we can all live under the righteous reign of the Lord in harmony and in peace together forever. He says, I see that. I see that in you, Jesus. So much of what you do points to it. I want you to see a good heart in this guy. Can I read my favorite six verses in the Bible? This is what believers will experience at the consummation of time when the kingdom is fully come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Jesus knows that Nicodemus has hopes that Jesus is the Messiah. 
the Savior of the world, those who long for his coming, the coming of the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom. I went to some lectures at Olivet a couple years ago that N.T. Wright gave. And he said, Christians, instead of praying, I want to go to heaven, we ought to be praying, I want heaven to come to earth. And he's right. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, verse 3, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again, to which Nicodemus asks, verse 4, How can anyone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. I want you to realize that Nicodemus, very smart man, he's a very intelligent guy. He doesn't think that people actually have to crawl back into the womb and be reborn. He gets the metaphor. He just can't imagine, listen, he just can't imagine what it would take for people to be changed so radically that it would be as if they were reborn into this world. I think he wonders if even God could accomplish such a miracle. Question. Do you ever get tired of the things people or even yourself do? The things that need to be changed about you and others. The other day I went into the new gas station up there at the intersection of 6,045. I went to get a cup, a cup of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts and a donut, and then also to pick up some Claritin because I've been having some spring allergies. So I get those things, I get back in my car, I drive to the office, I walk in, I open the bag, and no Claritin. And I said to myself, out loud, what is wrong with that woman? Referring to the cashier who didn't put it in my bag. You ever do that? How irritating is that? So I get back into my truck, I drive back. I, as I'm walking into the door, you know, kicking stones, I walk through the door to go in and I reach back into my back pocket and guess what my hand touches? And I smile, and I said to myself, not out loud this time, what's wrong with you, Bob? What would it take to fix us? What it would it take to counter all the drama and chaos we create in this world? Walking up on stage during the Oscars and whacking the host or telling a joke at your wife's expense bombing innocent people to take what's theirs for yourself, berating a brilliant jurist just to make political points. What's wrong with people? Gossiping and slandering and murdering people with our tongues. I was reading that as a society we are more depressed about the human condition than we've been in decades. I don't know how they measure that. Even pastors, they are saying, are at the end of their ropes, having had to deal with so many damaged people through the pandemic, political drama, and now the threat of World War III. Do you ever wonder if even God has the power to fix us? That's exactly what Nicodemus is wondering. How can anybody be born again? Don't you know people? Not even God can fix us. Jesus just continues to explain it to him. Let's talk a little more about this miracle and maybe you'll get it. Verse 5, very truly I tell you. He keeps saying very truly because that means I'm telling you the truth. Let me tell you the truth again, Nicodemus. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. He's reminding Professor Nicodemus of the prophecy of Ezekiel 36, where water and Spirit are linked. Verse 25, 
of chapter 36 of Ezekiel. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. It indicates a moral cleansing. And then in verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you, indicating spiritual life from God. Nicodemus knows these things. Nicodemus is right with him. And Jesus is dissecting the miracle of the rebirth into two sections for him. The first miracle section of rebirth is how God cleanses people morally. You know anybody that's immoral? Yes, like every one of us. Corrupted. We're corrupted. How do you fix that? Jesus says that God washes away all our sins. That's the miracle of God's forgiveness. Psalm 103, verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's a miracle to be forgiven by God morally. This bath is a one-time bath for our justification, taught throughout the New Testament. At the moment we receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we are forgiven by God for our sins, past, present, and future. And then we are bathed as many times thereafter as we confess our sins to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9. So we are washed clean as many times as we confess our sins, and God is faithful to do it every single time. So we remain in close fellowship with him. I speak sometimes about particular sins and raise some eyeballs sometimes. Roll some, so you roll your eyes back at me when I talk about it sometimes. The sins that we carry, sins that maybe are wreaking havoc in our lives, but God is not at all particular about all of our sins. Our sins might be different one from another. But we are all in the same boat. We all need the miracle of moral cleansing. We carry stuff that's dirty and rotten and corrupt. Things that we've done, things that we've said. Maybe even this morning before we got here. Or maybe something in our past, an affair that we had, or an abortion, or some disappointment that we had with someone, or betrayal, or maybe crazy stuff that people wouldn't believe that we've done. And often it's so much of the daily struggles with sin, how we keep going back to the same ugly trough to drink. And it can be easy to think that God would never forgive us for all of that stuff. But here is the miracle of rebirth. What it means to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ is God forgives you of everything, every time, for as long as you live. Everything, every time, for as long as you live. It's like a bath. It's like a miracle cleansing. What that means is nobody needs to leave here weighted down by our failures to be all that God would have us to be. Every single day you can be clean as a whistle, as my granddaughter says so cutely. Clean as a whistle, Papa. It's a miracle. It's the miracle of forgiveness. God applies that in the rebirth. You're forgiven. Past, present, future as often as you confess your sins to restore fellowship, you're forgiven by God. You can count on it. It's a miracle. What? No matter what you've done. And also, the second section of the miracle is God literally puts His Holy Spirit in us, Jesus says. God bursts the full resources of Himself in us to enable us to live for Him in all the different circumstances of life. That's a miracle. God in us. Jesus said, I'm going to come in the form of the Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you, and I'll be in you. The Holy Spirit of God living in us, it's a miracle. And so constantly having his grace and his power and his strength living in us to face the day, that's part of this miracle, Nicodemus. How people are reborn. 
cleansed morally, filled spiritually. I have a prostate biopsy scheduled this Wednesday to check for prostate cancer. I want you to know that I do not face this or any circumstance in my life alone. And neither do you if you believe in Jesus. Whatever you are going through or will ever go through, in every case, you are extremely limited. But by the miracle of rebirth, whatever you face, you face it with the unlimited resource of God in you. That's the miracle of rebirth through faith in Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And Jesus adds this piece for us. I think every one of us needs to hear this. So we don't think it's about us. And somehow we did it. Verse 8. Jesus says, by the way, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. Any control freaks here? It's not about you. Remember, it's about God. Jesus' point is that having the Spirit in us does not mean that somehow now we are in control of God. Sherry and I watched the new Spider-Man movie together the other night. You know, Peter Parker, he gets bit by a spider and becomes a superhuman Spider-Man, even greater than the spider that bit him. The miracle of God in us doesn't make us gods. Nor do we control God somehow because God is in us. What that means is it doesn't, we don't always know how God will work things out in every circumstance. But we know that he is with us and in us and he's working on our behalf. Don't doubt that. So we can find our rest in him. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit, Jesus says. They learn that. They're not in control. God is in control. They don't always know what God will do. In that circumstance there, but they learn to rest in Him. In my experience, the more we learn to rest in God, the more we will experience how He is with us through all the circumstances of life. The more we learn that, the more we learn to trust Him. The more we trust Him, the more we know that everything will be okay. Jesus closes this meeting with Nicodemus by challenging him to believe in him. John 3, 11, very truly again, I tell you. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus tells Nicodemus that there are people who do believe and people who don't. There are the we and the you. Nicodemus, you don't believe. How shocking to say that to Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. There are believers, Jesus says, and there are non-believers. But very clearly at this moment, Jesus is not talking to everyone else. He is speaking to Nicodemus. Jesus is literally standing right next to him, making an appeal to him to believe in him. The only thing left for Nicodemus is to believe. So Jesus invites him to do just that. John chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
Now, Nicodemus knows the Numbers 21 story about the snake, not missing the point. Jesus is like the snake on the pole in that story. He is the Savior of people who've been bitten by sin are going to die and are going to die. Nicodemus has been bitten and is going to die. We must, he must, what must he do to have eternal life? He needs to look to Jesus, lifted up on the cross, dying for the sins of the world to save him and believe in him. That's the appeal Jesus is making to Nicodemus personally that night. Now, we are not told whether Nicodemus believed in Jesus and became a born-again Christian that night. I want you to notice there's no altar call. Sorry, Rod. No altar call on this one. He doesn't pray a prayer. He doesn't raise his hand. This proves Jesus is not a Baptist. They were joking about my jokes. I really like my jokes. But anyway, actually, this approach is pretty typical for Jesus. With Jesus, the invitation to believe is just given. And some believe and others don't. Mostly they don't. You would say Jesus is a terrible evangelist. Most of the time they don't. And in the moment, the audience doesn't know which is which. But what we do know is if someone does believe in him, it's not long before being born again blooms into a public Christian testimony. In fact, they can't even hold it back. And we see that new life blooming in Nicodemus. We are told that Nicodemus speaks up in the Sanhedrin in defense of Jesus, that he accompanies Joseph of Arimathea to re retrieve Jesus' body from the cross and put it in the tomb. Personally, I believe Nicodemus became a born-again born Christian that very night. And we'll see him standing among the millions in the kingdom of God for eternity. So many people I want to talk to. Imagine having a cup of coffee with Nicodemus. So Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus one night about what it means to be born again. Is Jesus having a conversation with you this morning? Is he inviting you to believe in him? Some do, some don't. Good news. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Believe it and be born again, and we'll see you in the kingdom of heaven forever. How about that? Let's pray. I thank you, Father in heaven, for giving your one and only Son as a gift to humanity, sacrificing yourself out of grace for us so that we might be made new creatures prepared for eternity. Thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our hope and our salvation. Amen. And I'd like to serve... We'll serve you in your seats, and if you'll hold until everyone's served, we'll receive the communion together. It's a double stack glass, if you don't know. You just pop the one off the other, and you'll find the bread on the bottom. On the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, 
and he gave it to them all, and he said, this is my body, which will be given for you. As often as you receive this, you remember me. Afterwards, also, he took up a cup, and he said, this cup is a promise that I'm making to you in my blood. As often as you drink of this cup, you remember what I've done for you. Servers will come forward. We'll serve you in your seat. This cup represents the shed blood of Christ for you. Take and drink of it. Would you please stand? We'll confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you stay standing as we sing this last song? We were waiting without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets
to a virgin from the word, from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the grave. to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who've come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel to the world shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom I am free, for the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. There we go. I just decided while we were singing, it would be nice for us to close off by saying the Lord's Prayer together. So I'll lead, and if you'll follow. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go in peace. Have a good day.
and high.